Okay, so uh, the Torah reading for this coming Shabbat is a double Torah reading. And usually this is the case with these two Torah portions. There are short Torah portions and they're very, very connected to one another. The, uh, the first one is Tazria, and that begins in the Eitz Chaim on page 649. This is chapter 12 in Leviticus. Um, and Tazria is two chapters, chapter 12 and chapter 13. And then the next one is called Mitzora. That begins chapter 14. And Mitzora is chapter 14 and 15. So <coughs> not, not very long, two chapters each. Um, and most of the Torah reading is about the affliction called Tzara'at. So I um, have often written about this in Torah Sparks. I wrote about it again this week. Um, Tzara'at is some kind of scaly surface affliction. And um, that's, the, that's the main topic of both Torah readings. But the, Torah, the first Torah reading takes its name from a short one paragraph section about childbirth. And that's the Tazria part. If a woman should conceive and bear a child, and what are the rules uh, that, that govern uh, uh, childbirth with regard to the sanctuary? Um, so that's one paragraph. And then it immediately goes into then talking about this thing called tzara'at. And every time we have to go through it, it's often called leprosy, but it's not leprosy. And the way that the Torah reading proceeds is it first talks about a person who has some kind of a uh, rash or discoloration or abrasion of the skin, his hair, her hair uh, changes color, um, stuff that doesn't sound uh, too appetizing. And the Torah talks about that this is not something that is uh, obvious oh, yeah. about what it is. It may be tzara'at and it may not be tzara'at. And the only person who can uh, decide this is the priest. So the priest decides a person has to appear before the priest and the priest gives the person a visual examination and decides, are you simply just suffering from some terrible, uh, uh, you know, dermatological uh, um, uh, disease, sickness, go to a doctor, um, or is this a very, very specialized problem and that's called tzara'at. And if it's called tzara'at, then you become ritually impure. If you've got uh, impetigo or, or psoriasis, which sounds a little bit like tzara'at, but that's just a coincidence, you're not ritually impure. You've just got a, a, an uncomfortable problem. But uh, if you have this very specific uh, symptomology um, and it's diagnosed as tzara'at, then you become ritually impure. That's the beginning uh, discussion through the rest of uh, Tasria. Then uh, at the end um, of Tasria, uh, this is chapter 13, beginning with verse 38, the end of that uh, chapter, um, <coughs> we have the, the surprising idea that guess what? Sarat can afflict your clothing. So that this is again, so it's not a skin disease only. It's a surface disease. It can, it can afflict um, the uh, fabrics of your clothes. <coughs> so we go through, we get into the next Torah reading, Mitzora, with Mitzora means the person who has Sarat. And we go through the purification process because Sarat of all of these afflictions is the only one that causes somebody to be ritually impure. You can, according to the Torah, become ritually cleansed. You'll eventually get rid of the Tzara'at. Um, and it's not because you take certain pills or you get a vaccine or anything like that. The, the Tzara'at is, is supposed to go away, but then you have a ritual uh, at the tabernacle to symbolize and to effect, to make it happen, that you become ritually pure again. Uh, and uh, then <laughs> we get through another thing, which tells us that, guess what? It's not just the person 
and it's not just the clothing, but your house can get tzarat. And uh, that's not just simply some kind of mildew or fungus or, or uh, staining from, uh, from uh, you know, a water leakage. Something happens to the wall of your house, it gets discolored. And if it is diagnosed as um, tzara'at batim, the tzara'at of, of, of affecting a house, then there's a whole procedure about what has to be done because the house becomes ritually impure. So we have all of these things happening. Toward the very end, isn't this a great bar mitzvah portion? Isn't this like very exciting? I'm telling you, you know, Max, talk to your, talk to your dad and, and see if you can negotiate some other date maybe. Um, but uh, just kidding, it's all good. Um, and then the very end of the Torah portion talks about not skin problems, but genital discharge problems. Um, and uh, those things, fun, right? So, uh, and, but, but if it's only Tazria, then you don't have to go there. Um, got the, so, his angle. He's, you got his angle now. That's it. All right. So um, both for men and for women, if there are unusual emissions uh, that they suffer from, uh, then uh, they are rendered ritually impure. And we have, again, uh, the, the Torah deals with what's, what are the consequences of being ritually impure and how do you get out of it? So that's my summary. That's my Cliff's Notes for Tazria and Mitzora. And um, then now the question is, so let me just say one more thing because uh, I've mentioned this in many other contexts and every year we mention it. Um, this very weird phenomenon um, is understood by the rabbis to be a, a plague, so to speak, an affliction, <coughs> a, 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 you know, a zapping from God as opposed to regular disease. Regular disease is not, but this particular uh, aff affliction is understood by the rabbis to be uh, in response to who's going to say what it is? Hashan hara. Evil speech, right? Evil speech. So they they and you know there are little hints and 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 so on in the in the in the text that we could see might support such a thing, but it's still actually a big leap. What they're saying is that this is actually a, uh, uh, an affliction to uh, punish somebody who has been engaging in evil speech and speech is understood as something which is the great gift that God has given us as human beings. And it, it's what allows human beings to live together in society. So, Evil speech is antisocial. Evil speech is attacking another person, attacking the, the, the tissue that connects uh, human beings one with the other. And uh, it's considered terrible. And that's why we have this very special divine intervention uh, with regard to this, uh, um, to this sin. So that's the rabbinic leap that uh, is done here, um, which Otherwise, if it wasn't done, we would be looking at a text that really is very, very difficult to, uh, um, you know, to get it to get into. You know, it's it's a superficial text for a reason. It's very it's very hard to get under the surface of it uh, because basically it's very, very much about the skin looks this way, the hair looks this way. It's uh, you know maybe certain medical doctors. Could get excited about it. I don't know, Michael. What do you think? I love this stuff. You love that stuff. <laughs> I, I think it's just great. And, and and of course, it's not it's not disease. It's uh, you know, it has some parallels in terms of right. contagion, but it's it's something very different. And uh, yeah, yeah, it's a whole set of it's it's a whole set of rules as far as when right. something is pure or impure. So um, so that's where we are. Okay. Does anybody have a, a particular um, description of a rash in any of the verses that they want to look into? Is there any uh, um, 
you know, others a description of, of anything in these Torah readings that is particularly interesting to somebody that they want to look at. I could drag out my Merck manual. There you go. <laughs> there you go. So that's why I have to say it again and again and again. And it doesn't matter how many times I say it. There's many people all throughout, certainly modern times, who have simply said, this is just primitive medicine. It's just the, the priest is a shaman and the priest is just acting as a, as a primitive doctor type. And you know they were very, very afraid of leprosy. So they made a big deal about it. Um, and it doesn't matter how many times you show that this, the symptomology is not leprosy <clears throat> and, and the, the treatment of this particular disease is nothing to do with any other disease. And believe me, they had plenty of diseases. Um, it doesn't matter how many times you argue these things. There are people that are still completely convinced that it's just this ancient outmoded text that, uh, um, you know, that uh, reflects uh, the ignorance of, of the time. Um, I'm not of that opinion and I don't teach it that way. So, uh, and I think that it's just really actually not uh, doing, it's not reading the text. You, if, you, if you read the text, you can never even say anything like that. So uh, that's the way it is. I, okay, I, I, I have a suggestion. Yes, Michael. I, the, I, I don't know if anyone else wants to talk about it, but you know, one of the things that was, that's been going through my head with this is this whole concept of purity of Tuma and Tahara, you know, and the, the term Tuma is used in different contexts. It's used, we used it last week when we were talking about uh, kosher and unkosher animals. It's used sometimes with moral failings. It's uh, used sometimes with what looks like disease. It's used sometimes, you know, with physiologic functions. It's, it's you know, it has all these different uses. And I'm just wondering where this concept intersects with things like kashrut that we were talking about, with things like kedusha, because when you're tameh, you can't, you can't enter the, uh, the, the, the sanctuary, you know, and, and what the, you know, where, where these things all intersect, where it intersects with morality, you know, where, where this concept of tuma and tahara fits in with some of these other concepts that we deal with. So does that touch a nerve with some people? Have people been thinking about that or they have any comments that they want to share uh, regarding that, uh, that whole big topic? If it doesn't strike a nerve, I'm, I'm happy to talk about rashes. <laughs> so- um, well, we, The part just starts with that. It starts with the whole, um, you know, the, 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 the woman who gave birth. And when she is able to rejoin that same, uh, and Max is squeamish about rashes. He's not in the medical persuasion. Um, okay. but, but, but certainly, um, you know, th there's that separation between those, those, two, those two natures. Right. right. So, I mean, there's, there's been, you know, as long as this you know, concept has been around, there have been people talking about it, thinking about it, explaining it, framing it. Um, I think that the best um, short uh, um, to the point uh, framing of, of Tum'ah and Tahara is something that was uh, made very explicit by Rachel Adler uh, about uh, 45 years ago or so. Um, she's a very prominent uh, feminist Jewish uh, scholar theologian, teacher, um, and she had an interesting uh, personal history. Um, she started out secular and then she became orthodox and uh, eventually she left orthodoxy uh, and uh, joined the reform movement more or less. And she's now a, a rabbi and a professor uh, with the reform movement. Um, so along her path, she, when she became Orthodox, she started grappling with this whole concept of Tum'ah because Tum'ah is for men today, almost completely meaningless as a, as a, as a, uh, as a, as a real concern. Um, 
The exception is if you're a Kohen, if you're of priestly descent and you want to be traditional, then you are forbidden from coming in contact with a dead person. Okay, so that's you know the whole business about going to a cemetery, going to a funeral. If you've heard about these kinds of things, that that priests uh, sometimes struggle with this. Um, that's the only time that a male Jew really has to worry about tumah today. Um, and in general, it's taken for granted that we are all tame, that we are all ritually impure. And so what? Doesn't matter. I mean, as Michael said before, one of the big consequences of being ritually impure is that you can't go into the temple. That doesn't mean temple Shomrei Amuna, right? It means the temple in Jerusalem. We don't have that temple anymore, so it doesn't matter. But women do have an ongoing concern about Tum'ah um, if they are, uh, you know, able to menstruate. Um, then every time they menstruate, that renders them ritually impure and it theoretically debars them from sexual contact. So in the Orthodox community, this is still a live issue. And the mikveh, for instance, in West Orange, that's a community mikveh, is used by the non-Orthodox community you know, for a conversion, for maybe somebody who got sick and then got better and wants to go to the mikvah or something like that. 99% um, of the use of that mikvah is by Orthodox women. From, you know, uh, all, you know, and, and throughout the week, every evening, Orthodox women that need to, uh, um, you know, end their, their time of ritual impurity go to that mikvah. <clears throat> To, to become uh, cleansed, quote unquote, ritually cleansed. So she, when she was, uh, as a woman, she, this became a kind of a feminist orthodox challenge for her. And she struggled with the idea that this was still going on. And she wrote a classic essay that's in the first Jewish catalog. So if anybody, ever heard of that or still remembers that. The first Jewish catalog was at the, the end of the 60s, the beginning of the 70s. And uh, it was this whole new age uh, um, opening up of Judaism that was uh, the, you know from the Chavura movement. Sarita, you're gonna go and get it? Get your copy? Who knows? So um, anyway, she wrote a, uh, pardon the pun, she wrote a seminal essay uh, about about this whole topic, and it became really influential uh, to this very day. And what she said was that ritual impurity is completely connected to one's experience of death, and becoming cleansed of ritual impurity is to wash away that experience of death. So water, of course, is the source of life. And water is the main vehicle for not scrubbing with soap and water. I make that point every morning on Shabbat, sharing Shabbat. It's not about the, 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 the grime, but it's about immersing you know, uh, yourself in, in, in water, in living water, is what the mikveh is all about. So she argued that this is Judaism's great um, you know, uh, resistance or, or protest. There it is. There it is. Good for you. So you found the essay? It's in there. Look at the uh, table. Yeah, it's, it's called yeah, Tuma and Tahara Mikvah. Right. Um, what page? Because I have that it. one. Because it, it doesn't actually, it's on page 167. It doesn't say that it's her. Yes, it does. Someplace it says. Look in the okay. table of contents, maybe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or at the end. No, because, I, I, yeah. Anyway. It doesn't attribute it to her, anyway. So, so that's, the, that's Judaism's resistance or counter valuation um, of, of what's, of, 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 of uh, that life is holy, life is pure, and death, the cessation of life, 
the diminution of life, diminution of life, um, that's what is ritually impure. So the, uh, um, the menstrual cycle, for instance, renders a woman impure because it means that that uh, period of time that the uterus was uh, available to create life has ended and the uterus sloughs off um, that, that, uh, that accumulation of blood. And then, so that's a, like a little death. And that's what, re, that what's, what, what renders uh, the woman ritually impure. And the way you come back to purity is by going into the, you know, to the, to the mikvah. You count uh, to make sure that you're clean and then you go to the mikvah. Um, in our own reading, in the, in the uh, Torah reading that we have, childbirth renders a woman ritually impure. So that's a little ironic, right? Because you would, you know, according to this simple idea, only contact with, with death should render you ritually impure. But the, um, her argument would be that first of all, childbirth, certainly in those days, but even to this very moment is super dangerous. It's actually a threshold moment. It's a liminal moment where the whole possibility of life giving forth life is really not to be taken for granted, is really never to be, uh, you know, as assumed to be guaranteed. So, and of course, the, the mother is giving up a life that she herself was housing for however long, um, you know, that she was able to carry. So, that's what uh, that's what the idea is. Of course, coming in, in cut in, in touch with a, with a corpse renders a person again literally literally impure, and that's called a viavot tuma, the most central serious kind, source of tuma. So her, I I believe that her uh, uh, description and analysis is uh, very 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 um, cogent, and uh, and 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 I I see it as very important. Um, when it comes to tsara, and then and then Jen, one second, and then when it comes to tsara'at, uh, Jacob Milgram, following that uh, that idea, Jacob Milgram is the greatest uh, modern scholar of the Book of Leviticus. Um, he's written, he wrote a commentary on the Book of Leviticus. It takes up two or three fat volumes. Where's where's my uh, where is my, my uh, Leviticus file? Yeah. It's down there someplace. But anyway, it's like, it's something like 4,000 pages um, of dense, dense writing. Um, but his uh, argument about, about the, the leper is the whole point of the leper is that the leper turns into a, the walking dead. Right? His, his, uh, he, he's, he's, his skin turns alabaster white. And, and his hair just becomes, so he, 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 he conjures up this very uh, uh, shocking image of, of a dead person. And that connection with death is mentioned as well um, when Miriam becomes uh, uh, a leper, uh, not a leper, of course, it's a, 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 a tzara, a, a, a mitzorat. So, so this is the way I'm comfortable with starting to, uh, you know, with that's my starting point with regard to Tum'ah. So that's the ritual implications and that's the kind of, uh, you know, the, the, the existential implications. It's about life and death. Now, once it becomes as fundamental as that and not simply a legal technicality in a priestly code of trying to keep, uh, uh, you know, everything in order and so on and so forth, when it has that kind of fundamental meaning, it's very natural, I think, for it to slide off into all of the other fundamental values that either make life worth li worth living. I don't mean just enjoyment, but you know what makes a good life. And so, therefore, the Torah, you know, idea is: if you betray God's ways, if you sin, then in some kind of spiritual way, if not legally. Um, you are defiling the world, the land, you know, the, uh, uh, um, you know, the, the society. Uh, so for instance, all of the laws against, uh, you know, immorality 
that uh, uh, that the Torah will talk about in the next uh, you know the next couple of weeks are framed as don't do what those nations did because they you know made the land ritually impure by behaving this way right so so I think that that's the step by step kind of way of that of, of it going and um, it's been, you know just real quick with in terms of kashrut and then part of it has to do with with control, with, with impulse control, with, with ethical, um, you know, discipline. Uh, and uh, that's what applies then to, to uh, the eating as well. So uh, that's in a nutshell, you know, the way, the way I see that whole constellation of, of terms coming into uh, connection with each other. Jen, what do you want to say? Without um, taking away any part of that existential reading, uh, is is there um, a practical consideration for the mom here? And so far as she knows after childbirth, if she survives, she's not going to, the earliest she would be obliged to show up at the temple is like seven or eight days and possibly up to 30 something days. So it feels like, you know, well, when you're recovering, you can have this without guilt or any other thing. You know, you you just aren't allowed, so there's no guilt or anything. Right. Um, is that? It just seems like that might be a practical, nice right. thing. So, so you know what? Why don't we Why don't we really quickly read the text, and then yes, many many people. I'm I'm on board with that also. Many many people have noticed that, and we'll also see this little um, you know difference about what kind of you know you know, the gender difference and so on. So um, let's just read that real quick. We've got a few minutes and, uh, and we'll take care of that part of it. So that's chapter 12 in Leviticus, whatever edition you have. It's 649 in the Eitz Chaim. So Jen, you want to read it for us, please? The Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak to the Israelite people thus. When a woman at childbirth bears a male, she shall be impure seven days. She shall be impure at the time of her menstrual as, infirmity. As, as at. Oh, I'm sorry. As at the time of her menstrual infirmity. On the eighth day, the flesh of his foreskin shall be circumcised. She shall remain in a state of blood purification for 33 days. She shall not touch any consecrated thing, nor enter the sanctuary until her period of purification is completed. If she bears a female, she shall be impure two weeks as during her menstruation, and she shall remain in a state of blood purification for 66 days. Okay, let's continue till the end of the, ch of the, of the chapter. On the completion of her period of purification for either son or daughter, she shall bring to the priest at the entrance of the tent of meeting a lamb in its first year for a burnt offering, and a pigeon or a turtle dove for a purification offering. He shall offer it before the Lord and make expiation on her behalf. She shall then be pure from her flow of blood. Such are the rituals concerning her who bears a child, male or female. If, however, her means do not suffice for a sheep, she shall take two turtle doves or two pigeons, one for a burnt offering and the other for a purification offering. The priest shall make expiation on her behalf, and she shall be pure. That's the whole. That's the whole section. So, we see from this that the woman becomes ritually impure uh, when she uh, gives birth to a child, and it's compared. It's the same kind of ritual impurity, says the Torah, just like when she uh, was a menstruant. And then we have this period of time that Jen was mentioning. Right? So it ends up actually being 40 days for a boy and uh, 80 days for a girl. And during that time, she is debarred from coming into the sanctuary. And then after that period, 40 days for a boy, 80 days for a girl, she uh, comes back to the sanctuary with gifts and she has to bring uh, offerings to God. If she can afford it, she brings <coughs> an animal and a bird. If she can't afford it, she brings two birds. And, uh, and uh, that's the, uh, um, 
the, the ceremony and in terms of the tradition, it's understood that she also has gone to the mikvah. Um, so a lot of people have said that this is actually um, sort of taking her off the hook, right? That she doesn't have to engage in all these other things. She's got a great you know, excuse. She can, she can tell her boss, it's not that I don't want to come back to work, but you know, I'm not allowed. Uh, so, you know, I, I can't go out there. Nobody wants to become ritually impure by coming in contact with me. So um, it's a way of arguing that what's, what might be uh, seen as a stigma is actually a, um, a favor. And uh, other people have then pushed this a little bit and said, what's the deal with the fact that the, that the, that the girl gets 80 days? And the, and the boy has 40 days. Um, and uh, to make you want to have a daughter. <laughs> right, right. So, you know, it's, it, this is the Torah being anti Chinese, right? Uh, to, you know, to be uh, stereotypical, right? The valuation of the daughter is, is in certain societies lower than the valuation of a boy. I would never say that that's the case for Judaism, but um, thank you for smiling. So, uh, but uh, um, you know, this would be, so some people read it, yes, it's a, it's a double whammy. For a boy, after 40 days, she's, she's pure. A girl is, ah, she gave birth to another creature who will become a source of impurity. So it's a double, you know, so it depends on other people said, no, this is the, this is the bonding. This is the, the, the way that, that uh, um, the mother is allowed to bond with her children and reality is that the boy is gonna go off into the social reality that, that, that exists even to this day in many ways um, and, and uh, you know, have all kinds of other things that are gonna you know, occupy them. And the girl is gonna be you know, close to her mother. So this is a kind of acting out of that, of that reality. Um, there's another really curious feature to this text that I've pointed out um, I don't know, a few years ago in Torah Sparks. I don't remember when it was. And that is that, you know, I made a joke about, about uh, Judaism. The Torah is, you know, very much a patriarchal document. It's very man-centric, male-centric. And, and women are off on the side in, in most uh, uh, situations. This discussion of the woman giving birth to a child is, as far as I can tell, unique in how hard, it doesn't make it look hard, but in how intentionally it avoids talking about the men specifically the father, right? Whenever we have other children being born in the Torah. So, um, you know, we say, Ela todot Yitzchak, Avraham holidet Yitzchak, right? It says, this is the story of, of Isaac. Abraham begat Isaac. Oh yeah, what happened to Sarah? The answer is no. We don't care about the mother. We care about the, the father. The, we care about the patriarch. We care about the line going forward. And he gets credit for actually, you know, engendering, coming, begetting this new, you know, we, it's a genius word in English. I don't know. You know, it's like, you know, he, he caused the birth of, um, of this child, you know, without any mention of, of the mother. Um, here, it's the opposite. Here, the words that are used are Isha ki tazria vialda zachar. A woman who, and here the translation is when a woman at childbirth. Such a terrible translation. I don't know. You know, it, it's, they never cease to disappoint me. Um, but the translation should be a woman who seeds and then gives birth to a male, this is the law, right? Tazria comes from the word zera. Zera is seed, semen, 
And she's given, she's given credit here for being the inseminator. I mean, this is a conscious choice on the part of the text. It doesn't say the ish, you know, ki yolid, you know, zachar, the haita ishto tmeya, you know, etc. You know, it, it doesn't have the focus of the, the male at all. The, the construction of the Hebrew is purposely to avoid talking about the father. And then this male, verse three, uvayom hashmini yimol besar olato. And on the th eighth day, the flesh of his foreskin shall be circumcised. How? Automatically? You feed the kid into a circumcision machine and it just happens, right? This is the, the father's obligation. He's not there. He's not mentioned. It says it in the passive. The boy will be circumcised on the eighth day. This is a choice that the Torah is making not to mention the father, right? And then it again says, you know, the, the next, it's all about the mother sitting, staying with her children. What happens in uh, verse six and then seven and eight? She brings offerings. What if she can't afford the offerings? She brings the two birds. What do you mean she can't afford? Who's writing the checks in the family? Who's, whose property are we talking about? She's a married woman, right? We're not talking, the Torah is not talking about single women who are bearing uh, children out of wedlock. She's a married woman. She is subject to, to the control of her husband. The husband is the person who owns all of the property. And the Torah chooses to say, well, if she can't afford to bring this offering that she is bringing, not her husband on her behalf, then let her bring two birds, right? So there's, to me, a really, really, really astounding effort on the part of the Torah to give the mother, the spotlight, and to keep as much as possible the, uh, um, I wanted a, um, yeah, even the priest is sort of a little bit pushed off to the side. If you look at the, at the six, seven, and eight. Um, she's really given central uh, importance and, uh, and the, uh, the male involvement, control, intervention is, is very much soft pedaled in this. Moment. I have a question. So I think just one second. So back to Jen's point, <laughs> I think that, that actually lends support to this idea that there, yes, there is this, at least in this, you know, we talked about how miraculous life is and how wonderful and how good it is. There's, I think there's at least a little bit of a subtle acknowledgement here on the part of the Torah that, you know, whoa, what those women pull, put off, pull off is pretty awesome. And just for a second or two, you know, for eight verses, let's, let's, let's give it, let's, you know, let's give some applause to the women. You know, it doesn't last very long, but I think that there's something genuinely happening like that. Yeah, Meryl. So I, I see a, like a, a conflict between all of the uh, Abraham begat and, you know, son of, son of um, Isaac and this um, um, notion or requirement of uh, matrilineal, de <clears throat> matrilineal descent uh, to determine who's a Jew. And I thought the reason for that was because we know who the mother is. Right. Um, so, so, just so how, are, why is that different? Right, so that's, that's a big topic. We have only a couple of minutes. The short point that I wanna make is that according to the Torah, we don't go with matrilineal descent. We go with patrilineal descent. Mm. The change, and scholars argue about this, historically, everybody agrees that there's a change. That at some time in history, Judaism flipped over and decided to determine Jewish identity through the mother. And huh. not through the father. But throughout mm -hmm. the five books of Moses, for sure, Jewish identity is determined by the father because the father is the boss. 
when a, when a woman you know was was taken to wife by a, by a man she left her family she left her religion she left her culture and she went and she lived with the guy so what that was determinative of what the identity was of the child i'm of, yeah. i'm of the i'm of the opinion and not everybody agrees that the flip happens at the time of Ezra and Nehemiah. That when we have the return to the land of Judea, because uh, it's a partial return, we don't, we don't, uh, you know, we, we, that's when we become Jews as opposed to Israelites. Um, after the Babylonian exile, um, when, when the Persians take over and the Persians <coughs> give them permission to come back, so some people, the majority of Jews stay in the diaspora, they stay in Babylonia, but some hardy, you know, here it is, it's a little bit maybe, if, you know, uh, uh, appropriate to talk about this on Yom Ha'atzma'ut. Some hardy pioneers, some chalutzim, decide, no, they don't want to live in the diaspora, they want to come back to the land of Israel. And Ezra is the spiritual leader of that <laughs> return, and the return doesn't take a day or a week. Um, so he's in the middle of the fifth century BCE. So let's say about 450 BCE. And he determines that the intermarriage that has happened among the Jewish people is destroying the Jewish people. Because the, the women who are not Jewish, who are the wives, are completely uh, undermining the uh, passing on of Jewish identity. And the, the book of Ezra uh, and Nehemiah record that there's this huge um, you know, campaign to break up those, those families and to, and to chase out the women who are not Jewish. So many scholars, and I, I, I think that they're, um, they've got the right uh, argument, they see this as the, the flipping over, that it's not enough that the, that the father is Jewish to make the kid Jewish. They see that the mother's influence is determinative and they see that the, that the Jewish population was completely lost to the local cultures. And therefore it became a, um, a matrilineal uh, principle, which meant that the men had to marry Jewish women, um, if you know, if to have their children be Jewish, and uh, and that was a kind of a national policy decision that was uh, determined by reality, uh, by the reality of the time. Now, people can argue today, and the reform movement has, that now the reality is different, and therefore they're willing to accept patrilineal descent. Um, and, 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 you know, quote unquote, go back to the Torah. But uh, this is a, a very fraught, you know, uh, um, issue. But like I said, the reality is this, yes, it changed, it changed. The Torah mm -hmm. un uh, understands that the man is under total, is, has total control. So it really has nothing to do with the fact that we know who the mother is because the child was born from the mother. It's, it's more about the child rearing that the mother does most of that and she's going to bring the child up Jewish. That's the more, more the, likely than a non-Jewish right. wife. That's the gist of-, of, of Very the, interesting. Yeah. And with that, we're going to stop for today. All right. Zagazint, everybody. Yeshe koach.